Understanding how enzymes are inhibited has important implications, both for our understanding of the mechanism of enzymatic action and with medical considerations. In this lecture, I will talk about two primary things, reversible enzyme inhibitors and also irreversible enzyme inhibitors. Cells, of course, rely on enzymes to catalyze reactions. And that reliance on enzymes allows us to be able to control cells if we can control enzymes. And that is a consideration particularly if we have a bacterium, for example, that we want to stop from infecting something, or a cancer cell that we want to stop from spreading. So inhibiting enzymes is an important consideration for us for health purposes. I want to spend some time talking about three different types of, of inhibition of enzymes. And the first of these that I'll talk about is called competitive inhibition. You can see this shown schematically on the screen. The enzyme with its normal substrate is shown on the left. The enzyme binds to the substrate and uh, converts the substrate into product. On the right, we see that same enzyme that is the target of an inhibitor of it. And in this case, the target inhibitor looks like the original substrate. It fits in the active site of the enzyme the same way that the, the normal substrate did, but there's something about the inhibitor that the enzyme can't manipulate. It can't do anything with it. And that causes the enzyme to sort of sit and spin its wheels while it's bound to that inhibitor. That inhibitor is called a competitive inhibitor. And the competitive inhibitor has the properties I've shown here, that it looks like the substrate and binds to the active site. Now, on the screen here, you can see a couple of different um, uh, molecules. The bottom molecule is a molecule that's used by an enzyme called dihydrofolate reductase. The enzyme dihydrofolate reductase uses this molecule and converts it into a product where the product is used to make nucleotides. Very important for nucleotides. The molecule above it is called methotrexate. And methotrexate is very similar to, dihyd uh, to dihydrofolate. However, there's an important difference to it. And the difference prohibits the enzyme dihydrofolate reductase from acting. Well, methyltrexate is an inhibitor of that enzyme, and by inhibiting an enzyme that makes nucleotides that's specific for a cell, one could imagine that one could stop that cell from dividing. And that's exactly what this inhibitor is used for. Now let's study the effects of that competitive inhibitor on an enzyme. If we take an enzyme and we compare the V versus S plot of an uninhibited reaction with an inhibited reaction, we will get something like what we see on the screen here. Now I need to explain how this was done. I've described how we use, say, 20 tubes to generate the data that's used to make the uh, first line. That is that the enzyme plus varying amounts of substrate, each tube has a different amount of substrate, and a buffer are used, and we measure the velocity by measuring the amount of products, the, quantity, the concentration of products produced over time. If we want to study the inhibitor, we want the, the, the inhibited reaction, we want to remember that we want to have one variable. And the one variable we said we have is substrate concentration. That means that we can't vary the amount of inhibitor. So when we, change, we do the second set of reactions, we have the same amount of enzyme, we have the same buffer, and we have the same amount of inhibitor in each tube but we have varying amounts of substrate. What happens when we do that? Well, when we do that, we see that the reaction starts off and it's at a lower rate. That's not too surprising because there's inhibitor there that's inhibiting enzyme. The velocity is lower. But as we go to increasing amounts of substrate, we see that the inhibitor keeps rising and rising and rising. And by the end, it's actually rising fast enough that it is getting in the range of the velocity of the uninhibited reaction. Okay? We see that this, the, the, the difference between the two curves is decreasing. Now, I'll cut to the chase here. And in cutting to the chase, I'll tell you that if we go to very, very large amounts of substrate, we will discover that the two enzymes have the same Vmax. Now, why is that the case? Why does a competitively inhibited reaction have the same Vmax as, a, as, a, as no inhibitor whatsoever? The answer is due to the way that the experiment was set up. I said that we had a fixed amount of inhibitor. At gigantic concentrations of substrate, what happens? Well, the substrate, it's much more likely that the substrate will, will be found by the enzyme than the inhibitor will be found by the enzymes. At low concentrations, they compete pretty well. But at high concentrations where I might have a million times as much substrate as I have inhibitor, the difference between the uninhibited and the inhibited is difficult for me to see. In addition to the Vmax not changing for the a, a competitively inhibited reaction, something does change in this reaction, and the thing that changes is the Km. 
since the two uh, reactions, that is the uninhibited and the inhibited reaction, have the same Vmax, they have the same Vmax over 2. So if we plot on each curve the Km value, which we get from Vmax over 2, we discover that the Km value for the uh, uninhibited reaction is as we would expect, but the Km for the competitively inhibited reaction increases. Now that increase is indicating an apparent change in the affinity of the enzyme for the substrate. Now that I say apparent because it doesn't actually change the affinity of the enzyme for the substrate, and that's a, a deeper topic than I'll talk about here. But the apparent KM increases, making it seem that the enzyme is losing its affinity for its substrate. This is shown uh, graphically in another way using a Lineweaver Burke plot. So remember with the Lineweaver Burke, we take the same data that we had for the V versus S plot, and we invert all the data and then plot that on an inverted plot as you see here, 1 over V0 versus 1 over the concentration of S. When we do that, we see that, not surprisingly, the V versus S uh, data uh, comes to a line as shown in green with a Y-intercept corresponding to 1 over V max and an X-intercept corresponding to minus 1 over Km. When we plot the competitive inhibitor, we see exactly what we learned in the last plot, which was that the Vmax is the same, and the two lines cross at the y-axis. And since the Km value increased for the competitive inhibition, what we see then is that the minus 1 over Km gets closer to 0. The lineweaver burke plot shows us very graphically what's happening with that inhibition. Another type of inhibition that's important for us to understand is that of non-competitive inhibition. It's fundamentally different from competitive inhibition, and we can see it depicted on the screen here. On the left, again, we have the enzyme with its normal substrate, which catalyzes a reaction. However, the enzyme has a site on it that if is properly targeted by an inhibitor, the inhibitor can bind to it and keep the enzyme from functioning properly with the substrate in the active site. And that's shown in the image on the right. Now, when this happens, the non-competitive inhibitor has a fundamentally different way of interacting with the enzyme than what we saw before. They affect it by binding at a different location, and by binding at a different location, they do not compete. Okay. Now, this changes the parameters of the things that we've been the, the, the velocities that we've been studying considerably. And because the two com, don't, the, the, the inhibitor does not compete with the substrate, and the substrate can't outweigh it by adding an awful lot more sub, by doing a reaction with an awful lot more substrate, it means that in every reaction that we do, what happens is that we're inhibiting a fixed amount of enzyme. It doesn't matter how much enzyme that we add, there's always the same amount of enzyme inhibited. In the first reactions, the competitively inhibited reactions, we saw that as we added more substrate, the substrate outcompeted the inhibitor, and it was as if the inhibitor disappeared. So the quantity of enzyme being inhibited was changing. The more substrate we added, the more normal enzyme we had. With a non-competitive inhibitor, we don't have that. It doesn't matter how much substrate we have because they're not competing for the same site, the non-competitive inhibitor is always going to knock out the same amount of enzyme in every tube, irrespective of how much substrate is added to it. That means that we've changed the amount of enzyme. And if we change the amount of enzyme, we've already talked about the limitations of an enzyme and studying it with Vmax. Remember the factory analogy. In the factory analogy, I said that if we added an extra factory, we would double the amount of product. What if the factory only worked half a day? If the factory only worked half a day, it would make half the amount of product. We've changed the numbers of workers. So what if we use enough inhibitor that we only have half the amount of enzyme? Well, we would change Vmax accordingly. So when we have a non-competitive inhibitor, we're changing the amount of enzyme, and in changing the amount of enzyme, we change the value of Vmax. So Vmax decreases for a non-competitive inhibitor. That wasn't the case for a competitive inhibitor. All right? Now, we can only measure Km for an active enzyme. And not surprisingly, if we change the amount of enzyme, Km, the affinity of the enzyme for the substrate, doesn't change because the enzyme is still the enzyme when it's active and we're only studying active enzymes. So the Km value does not change for non-competitive inhibition. On a lineweaver burke plot, we see something different than we saw with the competitive inhibition, but consistent with what I just told you. In green, again, we see the linear, the linear plot showing, of course, the uninhibited reaction.
In blue, we see the non-competitively inhibited reaction, and we notice that the two lines cross at minus 1 over Km. Well, this is consistent with what we learned in the last plot, which is that the Km value does not change. They should cross at that point. However, we see the blue line is, has a higher um, a slope than does the green line, meaning that the crossing of the y-axis is at a higher point. Now that may seem counterintuitive that if we decrease the Vmax, we actually are raising the value of that line, but remember we're doing a reciprocal. So by decreasing Vmax, 1 over Vmax actually increases. Okay, now the last plot, the, the last inhibition I want to do is one that's a little harder to get your head around, and I mainly want to just introduce what it does and the effects of this in inhibitor. This inhibitor a type of inhibition is called uncompetitive, and uncompetitive is somewhere in between the two. A, uh, un an uncompetitively inhibited reaction occurs by a mechanism that you see on the screen. The normal substrate binds to an enzyme as before, but in the case of the uncompetitive inhibitor, it only binds to the ES complex. Now, that ES complex is on the way to becoming product. And so it's only binding at that point. So the more ES complex we have, which is what we're going to have with more substrate, the more ES complex we have, the more inhibited enzyme that we have. Now, that's kind of hard to get our heads twisted around. And we're going to see, in fact, as we look at the plots, that that's going to be difficult to uh, conceptualize as well. Let's take a look at the kinetics now of an uncompetitive reaction compared to that of an uninhibited reaction. Again, we're plotting V versus S as we have done before. The orange plot is the uninhibited uh, reaction, no inhibitor present, and we see a normal a hyperbolic plot. When we plot the uncompetitive in inhibited reaction, however, we see something that's a little hard to get our heads around. The problem, or the, the confusion with the uncompetitive reaction is that, first of all, we see that it has a lower apparent Vmax, and it does have a lower apparent Vmax. And the other thing that's confusing about this is it has a, a, a slightly higher velocity um, at lower uh, concentration. And that happens actually because the uncompetitive inhibitor favors the ES complex. It's as if we are increasing the percentage of the enzyme present in the ES complex. And that has the effect of apparently speeding up the reactions, which is why that first part of the curve, the uh, velocity for the uncompetitive reaction is higher than it is for the, the, the reaction with no competitor. Well, when we do the plots, we also see something interesting that happens, and that is that the uncompetitive reaction has a lower Km value. So not only does the uncompetitive reaction at high substrate concentrations have a lower velocity, because at higher substrate concentrations we'll have a greater percentage of the enzyme in the ES complex, which is greater target for the uncompetitive inhibitor, but we also see that the apparent Km of the enzyme is decreased. And again, this happens because the the uh, inhibitor is favoring the ES complex. It's making it look like the enzyme is binding substrate better. Well, that confusing result is reflected in what we see on a lineweaver burke plot. On the lineweaver burke plot, what we have is something that looks like this. The green line, again, shows the uninhibited reaction with what we've seen before, the 1 over uh, Vmax, the intercept on the y-axis, and the minus 1 over Km on the x-axis. The uh, lineweaver burke plot for the uncompetitive reaction shows a value higher on the y-axis for 1 over Vmax, and that's reflective of the fact that the Vmax has decreased, so 1 over Vmax has increased. And we also see the um, x-axis has moved farther to the left, meaning minus 1 over Km has farther away from zero, which is what happens when we have a lower Km. The three mecha mechanisms of enzyme inhibition that I've talked about so far, competitive inhibition, non-competitive inhibition, and uncompetitive inhibition, are fundamentally different from the one I'm getting ready to talk about here. In each of those cases, the binding of the inhibitor to the enzyme was a reversible process. The inhibitor could go on, but the in inhibitor could also come off, and these are very common inhibition mechanisms. The mechanism I'm getting ready to describe here, called suicide inhibition, is different completely from them. In suicide inhibition, what happens is, the inhibitor that binds to the enzyme does so irreversibly. And it does it irreversibly because the inhibitor makes a covalent bond with the enzyme at the active site. 
the enzyme can't shake the, sub, the, the inhibitor loose, and as a consequence, the enzyme is completely put out of action. Now, an example of a reaction like this occurring is that of the action of penicillin, which, use, which we use to kill bacteria. Penicillin works because what it does is it inhibits the, the bacterium's ability to make cell walls. Well, cell walls are pretty important for cells because without a wall, you don't have a cell. The way that this works is penicillin mimics the normal substrate that the uh, enzyme that makes the cell walls uses. That's the pentaglycine chain. Because penicillin resembles it, the enzyme binds to it like it would bind to the normal substrate, but penicillin makes the covalent bond. So in suicide inhibition, the enzyme is completely destroyed and never gets a chance uh, to come back and do its thing. Well, in this series of lectures, what I have talked about are different types of inhibition, a reversible set of inhibitions that include the competitive, non-competitive, and uncompetitive, and now suicide inhibition that is an irreversible enzyme inhibition. Our understanding of enzyme inhibition is important for anyone interested in understanding the mechanism by which drugs work or designing drugs themselves.